message, we're entitling it Fellowship, and you'll see why once we get into this. We're preaching through the book of Philippians. Last week was kind of 1 through 6, this week we're kind of 1 through 11. We're not being repetitive, but there's some things that, that through 1 through 6 we want to throw into this as well. Um, so, fellowship is, is one of those words that, that I think sometimes we take for granted. Um, like Friday night we had the, we had the uh, nice evening together. A good dinner or doing things together out in the community isn't necessarily what fellowship is. Although, you can have fellowship doing those things. But we're going to share with you this morning what makes for good fellowship, which in turn makes for a great church. And we believe that the, the church at Philippi was a great church. Paul wrote many letters uh, to the churches in the first century. And many of his letters, like the ones to the church at Corinth and Galatia, they were written to combat sins within the church. Now, the early church in those two areas had some horrendous sinful activity going on. And Paul wrote those letters to combat those sins that was within the church. While all the letters that Paul had written contained blessings and, and praise, and help for the church, but a lot of them, in fact, were letters of rebuke and correction. But the letter to the church in Philippi, it was different. In its pages, we don't find no words of rebuke. There's no words of correction. All that we find here in, in Philippians is words of praise and words of affection. Only one of the letters he wrote that was quite like this. As Paul begins his letter, he uses a word in verse 5 that I'd like to call our attention to, and it's the word fellowship. And like I said, this word and its concept, it's misunderstood a lot by the modern church in our day. And like I said, we'll have a dinner like on Friday night, we'll call it fellowship. Genuine fellowship runs deeper than a meal. It runs deeper than a good time together. The word fellowship is koinia in the Greek, and this word refers to things held in common, things shared. Biblical fellowship refers to those things that we are involved in and share in together. And it's in those things that we hold common ground as believers. And sometimes we don't, we don't take a moment to just stop and think about that. Well, it seems like the church in Philippi was a great church. And the reason they were a great church is that they enjoyed and they promoted genuine fellowship. Now, I think that we here at Liberty, we have a great church. Is there room for improvement? <laughs> oh, yes, there is. I would be the first to admit I'm still under construction, and we talked about that a week or so ago. So there's always going to be room for improvement. But there are some basic truths that all the redeemed in this building we hold in common. And these truths form the basis of our fellowship together. Number one, we share a common birth. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons. Now, even though we throw around the phrase being born again and being saved, there's nothing ordinary about what Jesus did for you and I when he saved us by his grace. It should never be looked at as old hat or common ground. Notice how Paul addresses his letter to the Philippians. He was writing to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now, that designation sets these people apart. He designated them saints. You see, not everyone in Philippi was in Christ Jesus. Not everyone who lives in the community of Ganges is in Christ Jesus. 
It is this state of being in Christ Jesus that makes one a Christian. Aren't you glad this morning that you're in Christ Jesus? Praise the Lord for that. That's a special designation. That's a special place we hold in the heart of God. We are in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in 1 John, whoever has the Son has life. So we have life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, that kind of begs the question, how does a person get in Christ Jesus? What does the Word of God say about this? Well, first, the Bible makes it clear that you cannot be saved by your own strength or by anything that you can do, like words or deeds or giving money. You can't do that. So how can I be saved? What do I need to do? I think sometimes it's, it's good to look at this again and revisit what it means to be in Christ. Well, what can we do? Well, the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You see, God has already done all the work. All we have to do is receive in faith the salvation of God. Fully trust in Jesus alone in the payment for your sins. Believe in him. The Bible says you will not perish. So God offers us salvation as a gift. All we have to do is accept it. Jesus is the way of salvation. So the answer to our question is quite simple. We respond to the call of God. Most of us can give a vivid description of that time that we responded to the call of God. I can. It's so vivid in my mind, I can go back and, and see little Kevin, 11 years old, trotting up the aisle at Dean Road. Remember old Tagging coming right down and kneeling right over top of me. And the rest of the church gathering around. It's so vivid. That's when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I responded to the call of God. I received Jesus into my life by faith. Christ gave a, a special blessing to those that, he said, Thomas, he said, there's going to become those that will not see my side with that terrible gash in it. And Thomas, there'll be those that will not see the nail prints in my hands and my feet that you demanded to see for you to believe. Blessed are they. See, we do it by faith. We receive Jesus into our life by faith. We repent of our sins. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart, that leads to a change in actions. And this change involves both a turning from sin and a turning to God. People have different ways of how all this, what step one, step two, step three. But um, those things are involved. You respond, you receive, you repent. Uh, now, you don't have to repent to be saved, but once you're saved, you're going to repent. Repent just simply means we're going in another direction. And if you're not going in another direction, chances are there's no proof in the pudding, and you're not saved. So those things all work together. We respond to the call of God, we receive Him by faith, and we repent of our sins. We all share a common birth that places us in the same family. So that's an ingredient for true fellowship that we have a birth that we all share in common. We share a common burden. And this section of the passage is summed up well by Paul's statement in verse 7. He says, I have you in my heart. You know, I looked at that and I thought, you know, I just don't ever recall slicing that out of that verse and looking at it. I have you in my heart. 
and, and that's something that's, um, every once in a while we'll, we'll catch it. Um, several times this morning I caught it when I shook your hand. I, it was good to see you and I, I have you in my heart. It, 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 and that's what Paul is saying here. I, he, he's reminding these believers that they hold a special place in his life. They are in his heart. And, and we look at this statement, we see Paul is in a Roman prison. He's waiting a trial before Caesar. Yet his thoughts are filled with praise for these special brothers and sisters in Christ many, many miles away at Philippi. Even as he probably has a sense of his impending death, in a very gruesome manner, he says, I have you in my heart. I, I, I think what a, we, we, we looked at Valentine's Day and I thought, what a Valentine that is. Paul says, I have you in my heart. You see, the, the place that our fellow believers hold in our own hearts reveal a great deal about where you stand with the Lord. So challenge yourself with that question. The folks that, that you attend church here with, do you hold them in your heart? Are they special to you? They ought to be. It reveals a great deal about where we stand with the Lord. Now, I'm not saying you're lost if you don't, but it does reveal about how close you are to him. There's times that, that, um, that I'll just pray. Uh, in the middle of the night, I wake up and I'll lay there and I can't go to sleep and I'll just pray. I know where most of you sat. Sometimes you change seats on me like Dan does. But uh, I, I kind of know where you sat and it, it, I go down through the rows and I ask God to bless you, to be with you, to care for you because I hold you dear in my heart. Just as surely as we all share a common birth experience, we should also share a common burden experience. Paul shares the four-fold burden, I think, that we can find here in this verse for the Philippian church. And in doing so, I, I think he teaches you and I how we should feel about our brothers and sisters in Christ. By the way, a burden isn't necessarily a negative thing. A burden can be a good thing. There is, for example, the burden of praise. Paul says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Wouldn't it be nice to have a relationship with somebody that solid that every time I think of you, I give praise to God for you. I thank him for you. Paul tells us that his heart is filled with joy. Every time he remembers his fellow believers there in Philippi, he praises the Lord. And that was his attitude. It, it wasn't, it wasn't mean-spirited. It wasn't condescending. He had an attitude of thanksgiving for his brothers and sisters in the church at Philippi. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. What an attitude to shoot for. Sometimes we get up and we're, we might be grumpy. I, I, was, I was impressed with the uh, uh, newlywed game because the, the question was asked, how is your husband first thing in the morning? And all three of those husbands, by their wife's testimony, were pretty good fellows in the morning. They were happy. They were perky. They were ready to go, hit the day. And I thought, that's how we ought to be. When we wake up, face the day, we ought to be up and about the things of God. He, he's given us a moment to live, a moment to exist. This is our time. We ought not waste it idly by being an Eeyore or being grumpy. We need to be up and about being a tigger. We want to do the things that pleases God. We want to have an attitude of praise. When we think of our fellow church members here at Liberty, how do we remember them? 
Do we rejoice that they are saved? That's not old hat. That's not common thing. Grace is a spectacular moment in our lives. And they are saved, and we have a privilege of serving God together. Isn't that cool? We, we serve God together in so many different ways. Not just in singing, not just in fellowship, not just being concerned like we're with a couple families this morning. But we, we, we share things together uh, in our offerings. We, we put the money in the offerings. It goes out and it meets the needs. It meets the needs at the well. It meets the needs here. And we leave that in God's hands. But we do it together. It, it's, it's fellowship. It's what we do. It's who we are. One of the great marks of a healthy church is a deeply felt joy among the members of the church. And that needs to be strived for. That needs to be cultivated. That needs to be uh, not taken for granted. A deeply felt joy among the members of the church. Not only is there a burden of praise, but there also is a burden of prayer. Paul says, whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. So he thinks of them, he thanks God for them. When he prays, he makes his request for all of them with joy. Not only does Paul praise God for them, he also prays for them. He carries their name to the throne of God to the throne of grace. He makes intercession for their needs and for their burdens. Oh, may we be a church that intercedes for one another. We, we know one another here pretty good. And Donna, we, we know the, the special burdens that one another carries. And we make prayer requests on their behalf. So what stands out here is that Paul, he cares enough to pray. And that ought to be the attitude of our hearts this morning. Do we love one another enough to pray for each other? Do we run to the Father when those in our fellowship are hurting? I have confidence in you that before the day is over that each and every one here is going to offer up a prayer for Bob and Connie, even though we prayed for them this morning, because your souls and your hearts will be heavy for them. And you want everything to go well for them. And you're going to offer up prayer for them. I know, because I know you care enough to do that. Also, there is a care, there is a burden of partnership. Burden of praise, burden of prayer, and a burden of partnership. Paul says in Philippians, verse 5, For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Are you partnering with the church in spreading the good news about Christ or has it waned a little bit since you've gotten saved? You need to, you need to cultivate that. You need to, you need to excite it. You need to have, have that enthusiasm um, kind of routed again towards, because again, being saved in God's grace is not common ground. It, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing event that happened on your behalf, and it's an amazing event that can happen on the behalf of others that don't know Jesus that's in your circle of influence. So Paul, he's very thankful that these people joined with him in carrying out the gospel ministry. This church was faithful to stand with Paul in these days and times of need. So we are in this thing together. The Lord founded this church to reach people for Jesus. The Lord founded Come to the Well to reach people for Jesus. And each of us, not only are we unique to get the job done in a special way that nobody else can, but we are essential to get the job done. It's essential that we do it. 
that helps to build and make a great church. I am not able to devote myself to prayer and to the study of God's Word on a weekly basis and the hours that's put in unless you partner with me. You pray for my ability to continue to plow in to the Word. You sometimes maybe push, push the plate back that the word that's being preached will lodge into the hearts of men and women. I, I don't take the sermons lightly. I hope I never do. And coming here, you're not going to get my opinion unless I tell you it's an opinion. And, that, and I always follow that with that it don't mean much. Opinions are like dog's tail. Everyone's got, not, not everyone's got a dog tail, but every dog's got a tail. But our opinions are just our opinions. But when I give you the word, that's completely different. My goal isn't to, to put on a show. It's not to work something up. Because I don't believe that, that the Word of God needs any props at all. I don't believe the Word of God needs to be worked up. I think that when we hear the Word of God, it ought to work us up. It ought to challenge us. It ought to catch us short. It ought to make us feel conviction and repent. We're in this together. I can't devote myself to study without you partnering with me in prayer. I'm not smart enough to do this. I'm not wise enough to do this. I need you. But by the same token, I'm able to bring the fruits of my study to this place and to share these with you in, in hopes that they will meet spiritual needs in your life, in hopes that it will give you spiritual strength that you may get the job done of ministry within your circle of influence. See, I'm not the only minister here. Matter of fact, you're the real ministers. I speak to you, you listen, you go out and you perform the ministry in the community. I'm to equip you to do ministry. That's my job. Your job is to do ministry. We're in this together. We need one another more than we will ever know. And I want us to be able to appreciate the fact that we are partners. We are partners in the work of God. And the awareness that we are partners will make for a great church. We also have the burden of a pull. Paul continues here in Philippians. He said, God knows how much I love you. Well, how bold he was. He didn't say, I love you. He said, God knows. God knows I'm just not throwing words out there. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Paul now tells them he has an overwhelming desire to be with them. He longs to be near to them as they serve the Lord together. There's something wrong with someone who claims to have salvation, claims to be saved, claims to be a Christian, but who never wants to go to church. There's something wrong there. And we need to investigate it, and we need to, we need to, to straighten that up. And if you know people that are saved and they're Christians and they're not going to church, there's your challenge to minister to them. Encourage them, help them. They have something to offer. Them being saved wasn't meant just to be saved and go about your merry way. It was to be involved. So it's a pull. It's a, it's a burden that we carry for folks. The Bible is very clear that we ought to assemble ourselves together. And I receive strength from you. And you receive strength from me. 
It could be testimonials about people that we know and share a, a, a love for in common. Donna shared with me this morning uh, about her niece Rachel, and it encouraged me. And that's what we do together. We, we share and we encourage one another. I receive strength from your faith. And I receive strength from your worship. We receive strength one from another. I thank the Lord for the desire that he's placed in our hearts to be here. You might look around, you might not see very many. We don't have traffic cops out there waving cars in and out. But I'm telling you, the essentials of the gospel, the essentials of fellowship, what we're doing in the community is very real. And I don't take second place to anybody with that. I learned a long time ago, it's not just about numbers, but it is about ministry. It is about scripture. It is about the sufficiency of God's word being applied to our life and making a difference in our community. Nothing wrong with traffic cops having cars come in and out. That's just not who we are right now. We may not ever be. We may end up having traffic cops having buggies come in and out. That's okay with me too. I don't care. I love the Lord. I hope you do also. So we also share a common blessing. The third of four parts that really creates lasting fellowship. In the book of Philippians, Paul says this in verses 5 and 6. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. In those verses there, Paul takes a moment to reassure these believers concerning their future. He reminds them that God who saved them from their sins and he who has worked in them up to this present moment will continue his ministry in their lives until they arrive to their home in heaven. That's a strong statement to make about somebody else a couple thousand miles away. But he does. They share a blessing, a common blessing. He was telling them God's not going to take his hand off their lives. He's going to work in them and ultimately take them home to a place called heaven to be with him. Friends, we share that common hope this morning. We're going to go to a place called heaven. And I'm telling you, take your socks off before you get there because it will definitely knock your socks off. Heaven is going to be a wonderful place beyond anything we could imagine. Sometimes I try to imagine heaven, and I just get lost in it because the only thing I can compare heaven to is relative to what I've seen down here. And it's going to be nothing like what I've seen down here. We share that common blessing. We're going to be together forever in a place called heaven. There's been those that have come through this church that that blessing applies to them. Um, there was a, a fine man named Lester Sexton uh, went to church here with us for years. Um, Pentecostal at heart, and he actually went back into Pentecost, but he didn't leave through any bad reasons. He was a good brother. I loved him. Wonderful testimonies. But Donna, we're going to be with him forever in a place called heaven. The Lord just took him home a few days ago. What a blessing that we have together concerning heaven. I do look forward to that day when we're perfected. When we're perfected and we stand together in his presence, in his home forevermore. That is a common blessing. We also share a common business. Paul is letting these believers at Philippi know through the written letter that along with all the many things they shared in common, they also are involved in a common ministry. They were laborers together for the gospel of Jesus. And when we look at the gospel of Jesus, 
Our gospel, the gospel for the Gentiles, was death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We share that in common. We're laborers together for that gospel. And to that end, Paul shared with them his prayer for their success. Notice what, what Paul prayer, he, he prays for concerning them. What, what he prayed for are, are traits. He prayed for certain traits that every one of us need. This church needs them as well. He, he prayed for their compassion. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. He's praying for their compassion. Paul's prayer is that, that their love one for another might continue to grow as the days went by. And this was a church marked by love. And as such, it's an example to our church this morning. Is your response to the brothers and sisters in Christ that come to this church, is your response always motivated by love? Or are there times that you get a little agitated and you get a little sharp and you think, oh, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that. I probably should have said that in a different way. Now, you can't pull those things back, but what can you do? Be honest. Hey, I had a tough morning. And I know it's not an excuse, but I said something a little bit out of line I shouldn't have said, and I am sorry. I felt the conviction, I'm repenting, and I want you to forgive me. And we all have been there. We have all spoke based on our present emotions that had nothing to do with the person we spoke to in a sharp way. We've all done it. I've had to apologize to my children. I've had to apologize to my wife. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I spoke out of turn. Are we motivated by love that goes beyond our irritations? Now, I know that what I just said is challenging. And I know sometimes it's sort of like, um, well, I'm thinking of that silly commercial. Um, buck naked underwear where the regular underwear just doesn't fit very well but he gets those new underwear and ha ah, this is good and he does all these dancing and this little cartoon character but when, when we're motivated by love past our irritations then we feel free we feel we feel good about that but when not it's just not comfortable and we have to do something to relieve that uncomfortable feeling So we have compassion. If we're to be characterized by anything, as a little church out in the rural countryside of Ganges, uh, let it be as a loving church. Let us show love one to another. May we strive to carry out the command of Jesus and be fulfilled in, that it may be fulfilled in this life of those that attend this local assembly. A growing love is needed to acknowledge things that are excellent. It is not enough just to know what is right and wrong. It's not enough just to do what is right. Sometimes the choice is between the good and the excellent, the acceptable and the best. Only a growing love will stir us to choose excellence. Only a growing love will choose us not to be settled for mediocrity. Only a growing love will choose us to do the best. We can all get by with less than, but dare we do that when heaven gave its very best for our benefit? You know, God could have took Gabriel, he could have took one of the other archangels and said, I want you to go down and and uh, take care of the sins of the world. He could have done that. Doug, he took the best. He took the best that heaven had to offer. The plan was to hang him on a cross. Let him become the sins of the world. He carried those to the cross. 
He gave his very best when he could have asked for thousands, ten thousands of angels to come and deliver him from the cross. No, he chose the best. Even though he realized he was separated from God, and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Gave up the ghost and he died. Jesus gave us his very best. Do we dare live our lives any different for the cause of Christ? Let's choose excellency. Let's choose the very best. Let's not settle for mediocrity, although that'll pass the mustard. But do we dare settle for that? Let's give our best. That being said, let me also say that this love was to be exercised in knowledge and judgment. That is, they were to love people, but they were to love truth more. And we need to learn that valuable lesson that sometimes love must be tough. That's why we're called to speak the truth in love. Love doesn't mean glossing over the rotted wood with the best primer you can. It doesn't take care of the rotted wood. So we speak the truth in love. Sometimes things have to be torn apart and put back together for a lasting, effectual result. Speak the truth in love. Sometimes the truth hurts. But truth will stand while the whole world's on fire. Truth will stand. Doing the right thing, being kind. Let your life be hallmarked by humility. Those are truthful ways to live. Look at their convictions. This is part of our business, you know, part of who we are, what we do. Paul says in verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. You just see Paul's love just dripping off of these words as he pens them. Paul prays that they will, he prays that they will approve. And that means, I'm praying that you'll put these things to the test. His desire is that they will determine what is of God and what is of the flesh, and they will go God's way. That's what he's talking about here. I want you to test that which is excellent. I want you to be pure. I want you to be blameless. I want you to go God's way. Well, if there's anything a pastor would love for folks that come to the church where he pastors, is I would love for you to go God's way. Put it to the test. Be blameless. Be pure. Not everything coming down the road wearing the name of Jesus is really of God. And that was true in biblical times as well as today. We need to check things out by the word of God and take our stand on the truth. There may be times when you do that that you might look ugly for those that's out there a little loose with scripture. But you take your stand for the truth. When we have discerned the mind of God for our situation, then let's stand on it and not be ashamed that we are the way we are. This world is trying to cause the church to be ashamed because we stand against deplorable sexual activities. From abomination in the Old Testament right into the New Testament where it says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will be tossed into the midst of the fiery flames. 
that will not consume you, but you will be consumed for eternity without actually being consumed. They want us to, 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 to feel threatened by that. But we need to stand for what is true. It's not everything that comes down the road that says praise the Lord is praising the Lord. God's people need some convictions. They need convictions, especially in this day and time that we're living in right now. There's far too many throwing their doors wide open, allowing everything under the sun to come into the church and affirm it and approve of it and saying God made them like that. We love them like that. No. The devil's a liar. He's the father of lies and his intent is to deceive you, to take him with him to a place called hell forever and ever. We need to stand for the right way. Some people call it the old-fashioned way. I'd rather call it look for the old paths. And when you find them, walk therein. That's the old-fashioned way. It's the scripture. It's the Bible. It's not how Granny and Grandpa served, but it's the scripture. It's the Bible way, and let's live that way till Jesus comes. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now we go to their completion. He says in the 11th verse, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. The righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. So Paul's final prayer is here in this, these first 11 verses is that they will be fruitful in their walk. Not just in any old walk, but they'll be fruitful in their walk with the Lord. He desires that the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ will bring God glory. That's what he's desiring for the church at Philippi. That's what he's desiring for the church here in Ganges. That we will bring God glory by preaching, proclaiming, living out the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the goal of every saved heart. To bring forth fruit to the glory of God. And when we do that, we will be successful as a congregation. That's a hallmark of being successful. Remember that when it comes to bearing fruit, there are a couple of things that are necessary. One, if we will produce fruit, we must abide in the vine. Paul is praying that the Philippian church will produce fruit. His prayers is for us that we produce fruit. We must abide in the vine, the vine being Jesus Christ. If we, if we will abide in the vine, we will not have to struggle to bring forth our fruit. It will happen naturally. It will happen naturally. The church in Philippi was a great church. Do you know why? It was because they shared these four things. They shared a common birth. You may notice we say brother and sister around here. We share a common birth. We share a common burden. And again, that burden doesn't have to be negative. It can be positive. We share a common blessing. And we share a common business. Those things produce authentic fellowship and it will make a great church and I believe that Liberty is a great church. I believe she is. We've got some work to do and God's given us the strength, the ability to do it and I'm thankful for that. We're going to ask you to stand.